Okay, so in class on Wednesday, we'll be talking a little bit more about potential diagrams. So we did Latimer before, so we'll be doing talking about poor bay diagrams, which relate pH potential to different species of uh, compounds. Uh, but for today's video, we'll be talking about electrochemical measurements. So how can we use electrochemistry and the concepts there to know more about uh, what mixtures we have in solution, um, or in other ways? So. Uh, the key thing to remember for electrochemical measurements is that the Nernst equation is really like the kind of the most important factor of what determines what we're measuring. So electrochemical measurements, I'm, I'm going to kind of oversimplify it, so you'll probably learn more of it in analytical chemistry. Um, but for our purposes, there's kind of two major experimental types. Uh, so the first one is potentiometry. And then, so this is when you measure a potential at zero current. And this is useful if you're wanna doing, um, you know, you wanna find your concentration of ions. So there's a lot of selective electrodes that, for example, like a silver selective electrode, you can measure silver concentration in solution. Uh, like so, silver in solution. We can also measure protons. So the pH meter is based on potentiometry, and then we can also find potentials at which um, we can, you know, our reduction potentials of different species by doing what's called a redox titration. So it's a very useful technique, and the way it works is um, you have here's my cell, here's my beaker. And then in that beaker, I have my solution of what I want to know. And so the way we measure it is I have two, two electrodes. So. And then so one of them will be my reference, which I will put like kind of like a little, here's my reference, little frit. And then here is a voltmeter, and that's what measures the potential and then here's my other electrode. So two electrodes. So one of them is, this is the reference. And this is what's called my indicator electrode. And then, so our cell basically is, we on the left side here we have a reference. So here's my reference electrode. And then we have the salt bridge. So this salt bridge is this frit that I drew. And that lets ions pass through to keep these two electrodes in electrical contact. Um, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll say what I'll reference electrodes later. And then we have our indicator electrodes. So then we have our analyte, which is in, on this outside of that salt bridge. And then we have phase change, and then we have our indicator. So the cell potential, what we measure, E cell, is therefore going to be the potential of our indicator minus the potential of our reference. And then I'm also going to add, sometimes you add what's called the junction potential, but we'll ignore that for now. Um, that's an extra potential drop across you know, the distance of your solution. So uh, the way this works, so this reference electrode is going to be, so reference electrodes, these are uh, what we just measure against. So it's a, usually a standard kind of concentration and also standard composition. So uh, common ones would be, for example, we could have silver chloride, silver. And then so what we have is this reference electrode would be a silver wire in a solution of potassium chloride at a certain concentration, one mole. I think it's standardized. And as a result, then we have this kind of redox couple, and that will be at a set potential. So then, as a result, when we measure the difference between what we measure at the indicator electrode, then we have a known uh, potential that we can you know, correspond to. Remember, again, every cell has to be between two half reactions. So if we, we have to standardize the one of the half reactions in order to get an actual meaningful result. Um, another common one is so-called the SCE. So this is the standard calomel electrode. And what it is, there'll be a metal wire in there, and what we're looking at here is mercury's chloride 
and Mercury zero, and that's the redox couple there. And so again, you have you know mercury, and then you have like your chloride solution, and then this will be a really common reference electrode that you have on one side. And so as an example, if our, our analyte, for example, we want to know what our cerium concentration is in this solution, we could use, again, the Nernst equation, and we have our standard, for example, cerium uh, E naught. Then we could use what we measure, this indicator potential, to then calculate uh, our concentration, right? So again, we could, we measure E cell, we know E ref, so we can subtract out, so we get out our indicator potential, and then we can use our Nernst equation, so E indicator equals our standard one. So the example I used was maybe like cerium 4 plus getting reduced to cerium 3 plus. And then minus RT over NF log reduced over oxidized if we're doing a half reaction. So as a result, we know this. We, we've measured this. From there, we can calculate our final concentration. So that's one way you could use that uh, to Potentiometry, we can know more about our sample by measuring potential. OK. So the other type, which I will get to as I erase, is voltammetry. Which is maybe one of the more common electrochemical experiments these days. Cyclic voltammetry you might have heard of. Let's see. I also have more detailed videos about these techniques that I made uh, last year during the COVID shutdown. So if you want to go back through my YouTube channel, you can find it. But it's not, not, you know, not required for this class. Um, what I want you to be able to do is apply the Nernst equation for potentiometry. And then for voltammetry, I want you to be able to read a voltammogram. So voltammetry. So typically for, for voltammetry, what we'll do is we'll uh, change applied potential and then we'll measure a current. And this is often used to find where your reduction potentials lie of different species as well. You can also do kinetics, so electrocatalysis often uses voltammetry as a way to analyze uh, the electrocatalyst that you're working with. So this setup is slightly different. Um, what it uses is a three electrode setup. So again, we have my cell. Okay, and then here again is my analyte, the pink solution. So on the left, or maybe not on the left, anywhere, We'll have our reference electrode, same idea as before. And with a frit. So again, this is my reference electrode. So again, it could be silver. It could be the SCE. It could be other things as well. Um, the reason we don't use SHE that commonly, because it's not as convenient to make your proton hydrogen electrode as always. So by having SCE or silver, we have everything in solution or as a solid phase already. It's easier to prepare. It's easier to store. So just like before, we have our voltmeter in between. And then here's a working electrode. And then we have my little like power supply, which I'll put as just a battery or something like that. And then we'll have our third electrode. So this electrode is the working electrode. And this one is the counter. So the reference electrode tells you where you are um, in potential, again, because we have a standardized reference. And then the working electrode and the counter electrode, are they apply that potential that will then drive your electrochemical reaction. So between the two is where you're doing the redox chemistry of your species, of the analyte. Um, and then in this solution, this will be your analyte. I will say uh, a good concentration maybe, you know, 0.1 millimolar. You usually want it in some sort of uh, electrolyte, 0.1 molar. So this could be a salt. It, you know, in organic solvent, you use tetrabutylammonium salts quite often. In water, you can use sodium chloride. You can use anything, really. You want to be able to conduct 
your electricity through the solution in order to do your redox chemistry. Um, and then again, just like with any electrochemistry, temperature dependent, solvent dependent, et cetera, et cetera. So with voltammetry, um, what we'll do is, again, we'll sweep our potential, and then we'll measure current. So sweep potential with the power supply, measure current at the voltmeter. Uh, so for cyclic voltammetry, often what we'll do is, so if we have versus time, versus our potential, so we apply. By cyclic, we mean that we go back and forth. So we can go here, then we'll turn around and do at least a triangle. We might do two triangles. So that's our cyclic voltammetry. We're going back and forth. The potential that we apply depends on uh, what area you want to look at. So that depends on your analyte. OK. And then, finally, what we'll get out is we measure a current measure current. And then here's our final data point. So what we'll do is then we'll plot our potential in volts versus current in amps or microamps, whatever. Um, OK, so one thing about convention, I'll show you, the, I'm showing the IUPAC convention. And then so we'll have plus here, minus here, and then up here will be anodic, down here will be cathodic. Uh, so it's important to check your axes when you read a paper with voltammogram in it because sometimes people do it backwards where they put negative on the right side and positive on the left side and then therefore cathodic and anodic are flipped. That's the American or Texas convention. So be aware of it. It's, it's the reverse. But this is the more, I guess, I would say more papers these days use this convention, which of course it makes more sense. So what happens <coughs> in terms of what's going on. So in your cell, at the working electrode, which could be, let's say, maybe you know this could be platinum, it could be carbon, it could be gold. It could be anything, really. Often it's just like a, a disk. And then your cathode electrode is just usually a platinum wire. So at your working electrode, here's my electrode. Suppose that I you know, set it to a very a positive charge. So at the surface of my metal electrode, you guys are all taking physics, or the biochem ones are. So we get a positive charge at the surface of the electrode, and then in solution, here's my solution. So the solution, again, has ions in it. And so what happens is at the positive charge at the surface of the electrode, you might get adsorbed negatively charged anions. So maybe chlorides, for example, if, depending on what your electrolyte is. And then we have what's called the double layer. So these are adsorbed. Adsorbed. And then so you know, within the double layer, we have kind of freely diffusing ions. But they're organized based on this applied potential. So I might have some cations nearby that are here. Keep in mind that these are all solvated. Boop, boop, boop. These are my solvated cations. And then they organize, and then maybe over here, we can, might have our kind of like diffusing anions, also solvated. So this is organized, and then you know, it'll kind of like rearrange, it'll keep on doing this sort of pattern, but as it diffuses out, as you go further with an electrode, it's going to get more diffuse. And then so your analyte, your molecule over here, has to kind of come through this double layer, and then has to feel this electrode in order to get undergo that redox reaction. So for current to flow, we have to have a kind of a high concentration of our molecule analyte nearby for, and then at the same potential where we can then do our oxidation or reduction reactions. So suppose that we are doing, suppose we have a solution of ferrocene. Ferrocene, which you remember is this eight to five iron two sandwich molecule. So this is my solution. And then so if we're over here at negative potentials, that's more negative of this potential. So nothing's going to happen. But then as we get to near this potential over here, we can then start oxidizing ferrocene because we're going to do more positive redox potentials. So over here, 
and current will start flowing as we transfer charge to the ferrocene, or from the ferrocene, transfer electrons from the ferrocene to the positively charged electrode. Then it'll reach a peak, and then it'll kind of plateau out. And at this point, we'll turn around. This will be our peak of our cyclical tamogram. And then we'll come back down, and then we might see something like this. So this is your duck. Here's my duck. So on this side, when, again, anodic current is flowing, this is when ferrocene is going to ferrocene plus, plus electron. So this is anodic current it's getting oxidized. On the reverse, once we're going more negative, then here is cathodic current. So this is when ferrocene plus is getting, getting reduced to ferrocene. So the amount of current that's flowing uh, just depends on, again, the concentration of, like, of your analyte nearby, and then um, also related to the potential, and then we can you know, transfer electrons there, and we get higher current. Um, so, okay, so this peak is called, where this potential is, is called EPA, so peak for anodic. And this peak over here is EPC, cathodic. Um, so when you have what's called a reversible process, we can both oxidize and reduce, then we have both of these in this duct shape. You can have an irreversible reaction where you first oxidize and then maybe does a second chemical transformation, and then you'll get a different feature. But for our class, I will talk about kind of reversible, nice electrochemistry. So from reading this graph, again, positive is oxidation, negative is reduction. These two are separated off by a little bit. And this is kind of related to uh, diffusion, so peak separation, also to the number of electrons that we're getting transferred. That's kind of beyond the scope of the class, but you'll probably talk about it in analytical chemistry. But suffice it to say, what we want to know is if we have our cathodic current and then we have our anodic current, we can average the two to get what's called E1 half. So it's the average. And so our E1 half would be somewhere maybe over here. And then so this will be approximately related to what's called the formal potential. And so the formal potential is instead of doing our standard reduction potential under standard conditions of one molar, this is going to be equal to the formal potential. This is E when you're reduced over the oxidized equals one. So uh, it's pretty close to uh, our typical standard reduction potential, but it's a little bit maybe easier to work with. So for you, the takeaway is you should be able to read what's happening here, know, know what we're looking at on either side of the duck, and then also be able to then you know, relate this to standard reduction potentials um, in a qualitative way.